personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Standard Oil Company of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Death begins at 45, another adventure of George Valentine. My dear Mr. Valentine... You have never seen my name, Wendell Mason, as a byline on stories or articles, and unless it's been in a garden magazine or perhaps a filler in the newspaper. You see, I am a writer, but I've never found a big enough story until now. But, Mr. Valentine, I have run across a grain of pepper in the midst of sugar, a black icicle in the midst of sunshine... In the midst of one of our most exclusive, quietest suburbs, what have I found? A criminal. One of the blackest criminals in all America. What is he doing in River Vista? Of course, he might only be visiting there, and yet, in that case, why should I, a mere observer of the scene, be struck from behind and left for dead? Oh, yes. It happened to be only this morning. Well, Mr. Valentine... That is my chance at a big story. That's for me to find out with your help. Well, Brooksy, this is where the character said to meet him, the city limits. There's the sign across the highway. Uh, just about as fancy as everything else in River Vista. And as sleepy. Some lovely homes, though, I guess, farther upstream. Mm, I'm happy right here. Flowers and sunshine. George, look at all the trees and blossom down by the bank. Yeah. Should have brought a radio. Yeah. I could listen to a ball game. Oh, there are other things to do in the spring besides baseball, aren't there? Track season's getting underway. All right, stick to business. <laughs> no, Angel, it's just that the... Well, this is the craziest rendezvous point I ever heard of. And it's 2 o'clock, like the letter said. Only what do we see? Just the big outdoors, you and me. Yes, George. Oh. Oh, look the other way. Oh. Coming up the path here. Hello. Huh? Oh. Oh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasant day, isn't it? Yes, it certainly is. Um, Out is for a walk, in... are you, you young people? Look, my name's Valentine. And oh, we're... well, uh, you, you haven't seen any barges, have you? Uh, on the river, I mean. Uh, freight barges. Well, there's so many trees, you can't get a view of oh, them. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. I thought perhaps you'd been further up, you know, up, up by the bend, yeah? <laughs> well, there aren't any, apparently. Anyway, not now. Uh, well, uh, pleasant day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting conversation. George, that man's awfully well-dressed to be just out taking a walk in the woods or, or looking for barges. Hey, and look at that car he's getting into. Custom job Cadillac convertible. Hey, hey, now who's working too hard? Brooksy, I think you had the right idea about today in the first place. It's spring, and the heck with business. Take it off. All right, you two. Break it up. Huh? Go on, get out of here. Get off this property. You're trespassing. Well, what? Find someplace else for your smooching. Go on. Hey, now, wait a minute, Buster. Wait for what? Uh, oh, a rifle. Yes, that's right, a rifle. I'll just climb back in your car and drive someplace else. Suppose I argue. What's down that trail anyway that makes it cough up such different kinds of people? Such what? That other guy. The pinstripe and the Cadillac. He wasn't exactly your general type. His fuse wasn't so short. I don't know what you're talking about. Was there somebody else here? Who was it? Well, we don't know. Who are you, Wendell Mason? What's that, a gag? Now listen, both of you. The name is Tim McNeil. I'm leaving and I want to see you get out of here first. Do it. Or I promise you'll be trampled to death by cops. McNeil's car is turned now, hasn't it? 
Heading into town? I think so, George. He's going awfully fast. Okay. I... George! Hey, relax. We're just going back to see the birds and the bees, that's all. Trample to death by cops, huh? We're going to find out what that guy McNeil was talking about. A houseboat. Sure. We parked in the wrong place before, wrong side of the sign to see it. Welcome to River Vista. It's tied up there. There's a regular pier. Yeah. Oh, it's a pretty fancy houseboat, Brooksy. Yeah. Somebody likes the good life. Here, around this side, I guess. Then somebody? Yeah. The good death. Who is it, George? Just lying there. Wendell Mason, it must be. It's not Mason. Haven't you ever seen this face before? Rocco Banyan. Rocco yeah, Banyan? he's big, all right. One of the biggest criminals in America. I guess he's been dead since yesterday. <gasps> huh? Oh. Excuse me, I... Uh... Did I keep you waiting, Mr. Valentine? Uh, I, uh, I'm your client. Well, Mason, so now you show up. Oh, yes, yes. It's quite a story, isn't it? I, I told you it was quite a story. Well, aren't you glad you came? Banyan died from a 45. Not from a rifle, Lieutenant Devlin? No, a 45 automatic. Here are the bullets, two of them. And the examiner says he died early yesterday morning, huh? Devlin, didn't the police have any idea at all that Rocco Banyan was in this part of the country? They did not. Why would they? None of his enterprises were out here. Midwestern boys, St. Louis last I heard of. Oh, but they come to California to die. Sure, it's the climate. Oh, now don't be bitter. Why not? There's only about 10,000 people in the world who might have killed Banyan, who have a reason for killing him. Yeah, but how many of them live in River Vista? I know. None. This town is clean, my friend. That's the trouble. That's what makes it hard. Be right back. Mason, come here, will you? Uh, oh, oh, of course, of course, Mr. Valentine. I, I've only been waiting. Why didn't you meet us on time? Where were you this afternoon? Well, I told you I'd been struck on the head. I, I had to have the bandage changed. Here, here you see, they're taking... It... Okay, skip it, skip it. Now, what are you doing in this burg anyway? You don't exactly look like the country club set. Well, I, I was just here to do some articles, or try to, on gardens. The beautiful gardens of River Vista for the gardening magazines. But now, holy smoke, do you know that just while you've been talking, I phoned in the story? I beat the local paper by five minutes. My, my story will be sold to the wire services with a byline. I said, what are you doing here? Uh, well, uh, two days ago, on my way into town, I saw this man for just a moment getting off the train. And, of course, I recognized Banyan. Anybody would. All his publicity, it's a face you can't forget. Uh, naturally, the the idea of the story occurred to me, so I tried and tried to locate it. And you did yesterday morning. That's when you got slugged, or claimed you did. And a medical examiner says that's when Banyan died. Yes, I was out here. I just walked out here. I, I, I just walked out here from the hotel, but the minute I got on the path there, well, I, I never even knew what hit me. A, a blunt instrument, the hospital said. Hey, hey, hold it there. Yesterday morning, eh? Valentine, this guy must have come here just when the murderer was here. Maybe it was the other end of the same forty-five that parted Mason's hair. Well, of course, of course, that's what I deduced. I've already put that in my story. Yeah, wouldn't you know? Say, Mason, what do you know about Tim McNeil? And watching Banyan out here, have you seen him? Who is Tim McNeil? Save it, Valentine. McNeil is the man who reported this thing to the police. He's also the man who owns his houseboat. Well, the guy's supposed to be all right. Sure, a nice fella, friendly, too. I'm only saying what I've heard. He's made some money on a bearing works, building a palace out here in River Vista and living on a houseboat in the meantime. What did he have to say about Rocco Banyan being here on his houseboat? That's what he won't talk about. But just to make you happy, McNeil claims he has an alibi for yesterday. Oh, I see. Now, my friends, this case isn't going to be that simple. This is the big-time kind. If Mason could spot Banyan, then so could other people. He could have been followed all the way from St. Louis. A hundred people could have come out here to call on him or been here with him. We wouldn't know about it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we would, Lieutenant. Uh, we'd know about one. 
What's this? Because I know. I was out here the night before he was killed. Well, this story of yours gets better and better all the time. Oh, Mr. Valentine, please. Now, I was out walking. I, I had just found out that Banyan was living aboard this houseboat. I, I was on my way back to town, and I saw someone walking down the path from the highway. Well, for Pete's sake, who was it? Well, he was dark. I, I didn't come back to see. A, a middle-aged man, I guessed. He's very well dressed. Oh, yes. I noticed back up on the highway the man had driven up in a Cadillac convertible. A custom job. Well, of course it's our car. Now, wasn't it clever of you to remember the license plate, Mr. Valentine? I'd like to use your telephone, Mrs. Reed. Hey, it's right there in the library, Lieutenant. The maid will show you. Never mind. I'll get it, thanks. Well, go on, go on. Tell me the rest of it. This is the most exciting thing I ever heard of. Imagine a murder right here in our own Sleepy Hollow. Well, we don't know much more yet, Mrs. Reed. Oh, but... darling, you do, too. We hope you do, Mrs. Reed. That's the idea coming here, you know. But what was this Rocco Banyan doing in River Vista? Mrs. Reed... That is a portrait of your husband up there, isn't it? Oh, yes. Of course, Huntley's really a little fatter than that and not quite so impressive looking. Well, it's the same man we saw, all right. And the same one who Mason saw the night before. You say your husband's a doctor? Well, I thought everyone knew that. There's nothing else he ever talks about. The Huntley Reed Hospital. That's what we have instead of children. But, oh, it's... It's very exclusive. I can't reach him in his office, Mrs. Reed. Well, did you try the downtown club, Lieutenant? His nurse did. I also asked her if your husband had ever had Rocco Banyan as a patient. She asked me how long have I been crazy. Oh, oh. wait till the gossips get this one. Well, maybe Huntley's gone out to the country. Our other place is up the river. It's such a beautiful day. Uh, the number's right there, Lieutenant. The Riverside number. Okay, thanks. I'll call him. Uh, Mrs. Reed, couldn't you just tell us in one sentence what your husband did say about Rocco Banyan? Well, here. Here. This is all it was. A crime story in the picture magazine. There's... there's Banyan someplace. Oh, there, there, you see? Well, Huntley said he saw him. We know that. Well, we were on our way out to the country place after a party the other night, and Huntley had to stop to see a patient, some other doctor's patient... Huntley doesn't usually do that sort of emergency business at all, but he said we'd be driving past there anyway. It was somebody with an infected leg or something on one of the river barges. But did you say barge, Mrs. Reed? Yes, isn't that preposterous? It was tied up right there at that same pier. Well, anyway, I sat in the car and Huntley went down a path, but I, I guess he got the wrong boat or something because he bumped into a man and had to ask directions. Later, when he came back up, he said, Guess who I saw? Rocco Banyan. Just as if you went into a drugstore and saw Hitler or somebody. Uh-huh. I'm beginning to get the idea. But today, your husband was out there today. And well, you said he was looking for a barge. I, I suppose he was just being conscientious. That's his sweetest virtue, bless him. Just paying a return call on the patient. Mm, yeah, maybe. And the barge wasn't there anymore. Well, I can't imagine why else, unless it was curiosity. <laughs> or unless he's been holding out on me all these years. Dr. Huntley Reed, secret associate of the notorious Rocco Banyan. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Little stuffy old River Vista suddenly jumping into the headlines with its most correct citizens. Oh, oh, Lieutenant, now we can find out. What do Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde have to say? What's the secret nefarious connection between my husband Mrs. and... Mrs. Reed, I... I only talked to a servant out there and a highway patrolman. A what? I, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll say it fast. They just found the doctor's body out in the woods. Oh, sure. Your husband's dead. He's been murdered, shot to death by a forty-five. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. There aren't many of us who can say, tomorrow morning I'll go out and buy a brand new car, just like that. But it's so easy for you to get and keep that new car feeling with the car you're driving now. How do you do it? Just by using Chevron Supreme gasoline. Most raw gasoline contains impurities that form engine-sticking gum. And few things can rob a car of its power faster than gum. Chevron Supreme is the gasoline that's super-refined to eliminate gum. Try a tank full. 
you'll see why we say it gives you that new car feeling. Better starting, better pickup, new power on hills, full mileage in the kind of driving you do. Ask for super-refined Chevron Supreme at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Death begins at 45, and so far, a 45 has been the death of two men. Rock O'Banion, a big-time gangster, and Dr. Huntley Reed, the most dignified physician in the peaceful suburb of River Vista. If your name is George Valentine, you know that this one won't be easy to tie together. No more connection than between the houseboat on which Banion was killed and the barge, which Dr. Reed supposedly visited a day or two earlier. Because now the police have located that barge at the next town down the river, and the last thing it seems to carry is information. Murder. No, that's that's bad. Yeah, that's too bad. Really. Read it to him, yes. Bruce. All right. right, George. And the police have definitely proved that it was the same gun, the oh, same caliber forty-five automatic that must have been used to kill both men. So, so, uh, that, that's too bad. Well, no, that's been right in the newspaper for the past half hour. Here's the rest. Right. According to Mrs. Reed's account, her husband only saw Rock O'Banion for a short moment. As she sat in the car that night before the first murder, Dr. Reed walked down toward the pier... How about that part, friend? Uh, how about that? What was your barge doing at that pier that night, anyway? Oh, uh, well, that's an easy place to tie up. You see, my leg here was infected, and it was an easy place for the deckhand to go on the shore and telephone for the doctor. He came back to see uh, you again a day later, and you oh, were gone. Oh, sure, sure. I go to the car, go to think about it, and my leg, she's better, so we go the same night. Come on, Valentine. This is a waste of time. No luck with the deckhand? No possible connection here with Banyan. Another dead end. All we do is confirm Mrs. Reed's story about her husband that night. Yeah, I know. So there's only one thing to do, isn't there? McNeil? Yeah, McNeil. And Devlin, how about letting me have a try at the rising businessman by myself? I've got an alibi, Valentine. I wasn't even out here those two or three days. Not so perfect an alibi, McNeil. Staying in town in a hotel, partying with friends. You still might have had a chance to get out here and kill Banyan. There was somebody with me all the time. There was what? I said all the time, every minute. There oh, was... yeah, yeah, sure, I saw the list. You were with various respected citizens all the time. But a guy isn't normally that sociable, is he? Unless he sets it up that way. Oh, you're Why crazy. were you so nervous? Who'd you expect? Nothing, I, I wasn't. Why I was just... Rocco Banyan staying in your houseboat? Okay, shall I do a little guessing? Shall I talk about a rising businessman who's made a little money and come out to build a home where the rich people live? It's a nice place out here. The climate. I notice you good. can't take your eyes off the newspapers over there. You don't like being mixed up in all this, do you, McNeil? Well, look at that stuff. The big shot gangster. And the doctor. How does he tie in? He's respectable. How should I know? Punks who write that stuff, this beagle nosed Mason, whoever he Let's is. Let's get back to Rocco Banyan. Let's see what makes you so touchy about the publicity. Why are you so? He's my brother. That's why. Your brother? Yeah. A brother to be proud of. To love. I haven't seen him for years, Valentine. You saw him last week. He just showed up in town. He knew I had the houseboat. Why did he come? How should I know? Take a rest, he said. He wasn't actually a fugitive or anything. What could I do? Give him the keys and move out yourself? If I threw him out, what would happen then? I haven't liked the guy for years. I hate him. I even changed my name not to be mixed up with him. Sure, I was with people, but it, it wasn't to set up any alibis. Rocco said he'd just stay a few days. He wanted to rest where it'd be quiet, where he could be alone. Where he could be alone, huh? Alone. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where are you going? To put this together fast, McNeil. What? Yeah, put it together before somebody else gets hurt. Hurry up and connect me with that number, will you, operator? Uh, Valentine, will you Hello? please... Hello? Hello, Mrs. Reed. This is George Valentine. Oh, I'm so glad you called. Have you found anything... Mrs. Reed, I... look, I'm in a hurry. Please listen. 
The other night when you were with your husband and you waited for him in your car parked under that brightly lighted sign, did, did you see anyone at all? Uh, no, of course well, not. Well, did your husband... Did he mention seeing anybody besides Banyan? Aside from his patient and the deckhand or whatever it was? That's right, on the houseboat. Let me see. I, well, I don't remember exactly. I don't think so. But, well, Mr. Valentine, naturally, at the time, we didn't think anything was important. All right, never mind, Mrs. Reed. I think your husband may have been killed because he saw someone besides Banyan there. Or at least because that someone thought your husband saw him. Hey. I don't understand. Mrs. Reed, are you alone in your house now? Well, yes. The servants went to the movies. If I... your husband was killed because he'd been a witness to something... You must be on the list, too. So lock the windows, will you, lady? We're coming right out. George. Will you buy it, Devlin? Yep. Only, brother, you left out something. Story in the paper. I know. A murderer thinks in a straight line. One, two. First kill Rocco Banyan, then knock over the doctor because he might have seen you. Yes, it's the only way it makes sense. Even if the murderer didn't notice Mrs. Reed waiting in her car, this newspaper told him she might be another witness. Practically told him he'd better play safe and get rid of her, too. Well, all right, what are we waiting for? Let's go. Oh, fancy spot, isn't it? Yeah, I guess the front door's this way. It's so dark, you can't George, tell. there's somebody up there at the door. Hey, that's Mason. Come on. Yeah, come on. All right, Joe. Hey, who's that? Who is that? Shoot. Got him, Devlin? Yeah, I got him. Come on. Come on. This is Reed. Back, Open the door. This is Reed. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine. Hey, now, take it easy. You're all right. I, I was... Come on. Come on. Back inside. He's been pounding there on the door. Is anybody else here, Mrs. Reed? Oh, no, there wasn't. After you telephoned, I began to realize what it all meant. To realize I was in danger, too. Here, you'd better sit down. It even occurred to me. It's so simple. It explains everything. Pompey was killed because he saw it. People would think that I saw, too. Well, you don't have to worry anymore, Mrs. Reed. Oh, it's so hard to get used to the idea that somebody might want to kill you. You never even think such people exist. Okay, Valentine. Here's our man. Oh, Mr. Valentine, I, I didn't mean anything. He tried to get in. It's the stories, that's all. Just my stories. What do you mean? Well, Mr. Valentine, I wrote too much. I said too much in my stories. So I came out here to warn Mrs. Reed. Now, listen, my I friend. I had written it. It was so obvious, and yet I hadn't seen it myself. It's been in the papers since noon. Mrs. Reed's name about being out there with her husband that night. I, I was afraid my writing it might have got her killed. You, you mean... Yeah, that Devlin, you... it's turning into a chorus, isn't it? We're all catching on at once, all solving it the same way. But all our figuring of the how and why of the murders doesn't help us with a who, does it? No. Come on, Mason. I want to talk to you some more. In there. Hey, would you take some notes, Miss Brooks? Oh, sure, Lieutenant. I feel a lot safer now that you're here, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, okay. Mason had a point, don't you think, Mrs. Reed? The murderer must have seen a paper at noon. Well? Well, Mrs. Reed, it's nighttime now, and you've been alone and accessible a lot of the time since noon... The murderer, that is. Oh, don't remind so me. So if it's true that the only reason for killing respectable people is because they had the misfortune to be near Rocco Banyan once, well, then, uh, why aren't you dead? What? Why, oh, do you always say such charming things to people? Mrs. Who... Reed, I know it's a shot in the dark, but why haven't you been shot in the dark in all this time? Why haven't you? Because Mr. Banyan's little friend with the forty-five has such atrocious aim, perhaps. Because he ran out of bullets. How should I know? There was plenty of good aim that killed Banyan, lady, and then killed your husband the next day. Yes, my husband. For being very considerate. Sure, it was simple murder. One, two. A big-time gangster with a few thousand enemies, and then the innocent bystander from the clean little town. Only why haven't you been killed, too? Will you please stop? Will you Mrs. let... Mrs. Reed, you cooked up a murder scheme that's 50 times as cold-blooded as anything Banyan's 10,000 enemies ever could think of. I don't know anything about Mr. Banyan. I only saw his picture in a magazine once. Yeah. Yeah, sure, you saw his picture in a magazine, all right. But your husband saw him. I guess that's what gave you the idea, wasn't it? I'm not... I'm not filled with ideas And like it would have worked so beautifully. The police could look for years for Banyan's killer. Only, why weren't you killed, too? I... Unless you're the murderer yourself, Mrs. Reed. Unless the whole thing is upside down. Unless it isn't a one-two case. No, it's very neat, very neat. This time, two comes first. Rocco Banyan was killed a whole day before my In husband... order of importance. Now, suppose you wanted to get rid of your husband. And suppose one night he happened to see a famous gangster in town. Boy, what an opportunity. 
At least if you're cold-blooded enough to be able to go out and just shoot that gangster. No, I didn't. You're you lying. You made a perfect murder, didn't it? Because then you can wait until the next day and kill your husband without anyone ever guessing that the chicken came first instead of the egg. I didn't do it. I didn't. I didn't. Okay, Mrs. Reed. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe if we go looking for evidence where you never expected us to, like in places where you must have bought the gun, places where we might find your fingerprints, lots of places like that. Oh, maybe we won't find anything. I don't know. Only, uh, only if I am wrong about all this, then why weren't you killed too? Why weren't you killed too? I will be. I will be now. <laughs> Mrs. Huntley Reed. Member of all the best clubs. One of the wealthiest women in River Vista. Charming hostess. And she talked too much, Brooksy. Maybe we should have caught on earlier. I don't know. The despairing way she rattled off about her husband. And now it seems she's been wanting to kill him for years. Oh, but George, lots of women talk that way about their husbands. It doesn't necessarily I know they do. I know they do. That's the trouble. What? Oh, you mean... Well, lots of women don't, George. Uh Depends on the personality, I suppose. Huh? Oh. Do you think I'm going to rise to that bait? You're crazy. Mm -hmm. Do you think I'm going to say I wouldn't say nasty things about you? You're crazy. (laughs) If you think... Oh, I don't know. Maybe you are sort of crazy. If you've already discovered that new car feeling by using super-refined Chevron Supreme gasoline, why not take it one easy step further for that new car look? You can't change the shape of your car, but it could be easier to keep it sparkling bright, clean, and shining. The car savers at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations know this, and that's why they keep on hand for you Atlas Auto Wash and Atlas Auto Polish. With the auto wash, you just add a small quantity to water, and it quickly removes dirt and grease, oil and road film, leaves the entire surface of your car spanking clean. And with the Atlas Auto Polish, you can get your car as bright as a polished silver in just one operation. And let me remind you, besides the satisfaction you get by keeping up that new car look, don't forget that when it comes time for trade-in value, the very first thing a buyer sees is that clean, brightly polished finish. Ask for these two Car Saver products tomorrow. Ask at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard Oil Company of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Pat McGeehan was heard as Lieutenant Devlin, Bob Griffin as Mason, Bill Conrad as McNeil, Dara Singleton as Mrs. Reed, and Larry Dobkin as Reed. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. It's a fact that anyone can develop cancer, but it's a fact, too, that we're not just going to sit back and do nothing about this serious disease. Join the 1950 Cancer Crusade. Help science help you. Mail a generous contribution today to Cancer, care of your local post office. Remember, we must all strike back. This is John Heaston reminding you that although daylight saving time will go into effect next week, You will hear Let George Do It at the same time on this same station. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.